There's a small bronze statue of a girl on the site of an effigy tomb in Westminster Abbey. The tomb is that of Edward III of England, and the little weeping statue is one of a set who served to stand and mourn the great king. It's a beautiful little figure. She's wearing a reticulated headdress, a coat hardy, and long sleeves. She stands watch above the coat of arms depicting Castile and Leon, joining France and England. This particular figure is an effigy of Joan, King Edward's oldest daughter and the favorite of all his 12 children. Tragically, Joan died far from home at the age of 14, en route to Spain to marry Prince Pedro of Castile. She was one of the first English victims of the Great Mortality, or what we now call the Black Death. She died alone in France before the pestilence had even arrived on the shores of England. In the summer of 1348, Joan left England heavily guarded with the blessings of both her parents. One of the scheduled visits was to one of her family's castles in Bordeaux, France. She was escorted by over a hundred English bowmen, carried a luxurious, portable, gold-covered chapel, and an enormous amount of personal effects, so much so that the trousseau alone required an entire ship. When her retinue landed in Bordeaux, they were warned of the pestilence that was ravaging the port and retreated to the village of Loremo, where Joan was one of the first to die, violently, of a swift attack that claimed her life July 1st, 1348. The news of Joan's death shocked the locals to their core, having come to the horrifying realization that even royalty would not be spared the ravages of the plague. Joan's heartbroken father sent a letter to King Alfonso of Castile, terminating the marriage arrangements and describing the sorrow that he and his family suffered at Joan's sudden death. But see, with what intense bitterness of heart we have to tell you this. Destructive death, who seizes young and old alike, sparing no one and reducing rich and poor to the same level, has lamentably snatched from both of us our dearest daughter, whom we love best of all, as her virtues demanded. No fellow human being could be surprised if we were inwardly desolated by the sting of this bitter grief. For we are humans too. But we who have placed our trust in God and our life between his hands, where he has held it closely through many great dangers, we give thanks to him that one of our own family, free of all stain, whom we have loved with our life, has been sent ahead to heaven to reign among the choirs of virgins where she can gladly intercede for our offenses before God himself. King Edward then sent an expedition paying men triple the normal rate for such a risky exploit to retrieve Joan's body and bring her home. But the port of Bordeaux had been put to the flame and Joan's body along with it. All that's left of Joan, what she may have looked like, who she was, is that little bronze figurine who weeps in perpetuity at the tomb of her father. I'm Kathy Rick, installation artist, performance artist, and photographer. From a very early age, I've been interested in art, history, and being scared. I am excited about Artists Obscura because it's going to give me and you a chance to explore the dark parts of the human imagination, creativity, and the mind. Welcome to episode one, entitled Worms and Ashes. To understand the art that was created during and following the Black Death, it's important to try to step into the psyche of the average medieval person living through this incredible nightmare. In the mid-1340s, the bubonic plague had swept through Europe. Uh, it had wiped out at least a third, and by some estimates, two-thirds of Europe's population in seven years. No one was spared, not peasant, not king, not cleric. It was and remains the single greatest disaster in European history. Peasants dropped dead in the fields. Villages were wiped off the map, sometimes forever, if replicated on the same scale today, the plague would have killed nearly 2 billion people. By May 1348, the plague had reached the city of Siena in Italy. It came on the heels of several disastrous events like banking crises, crop failures, hailstorms, and looming famines. 
but it was going to get a lot worse. The mass mortality caused by the Black Death was seen as the wrath of God, and by some, literally, the end of the world. Francesco Petrarch, an Italian scholar, poet, and the founder of Renaissance humanism, described an environment of, quote, empty houses, derelict cities, ruined estates, fields strewn with cadavers, and a horrible and vast solitude encompassing the whole world. He writes, I cannot say this without shedding many tears. Where are our sweet friends now? Where are the beloved faces? What abyss swallowed them? Once we were all together, now we are quite alone. We should make new friends, but where, or with whom, when the human race is nearly extinct? And it is predicted that the end of the world is soon at hand. We are, why pretend, truly alone? I got goosebumps. To take what we treat as existential dread and have it be made literal in front of our eyes, the despair these people experienced must have been absolutely hard to imagine. The Sienese chronicler Agnolo di Toro wrote, There are not words to describe how horrible these events have been. I've buried five of my sons with my own hands. And Guy de Choliac, who was, quote, a sober and careful observer, recorded widespread death, fear, and abandonment. He observed that, quote, The father did not visit his son, nor the son his father. Charity was dead and hope destroyed. Boccaccio echoed this phenomenon of abandonment in the introduction to the Decameron. Quote, this tribulation had stricken such terror to the hearts of all, men and women alike, that brother forsook brother. Uncle, nephew, sister, brother, and oft times wife, husband. Nay, what is yet more extraordinarily and well nigh incredible, fathers and mothers refuse to visit or tend to their very children. End quote. Curiously, there is pretty much no art of the Black Death that was created during the Black Death. That's not terribly surprising, as the populace, artists included, were too busy dying. But the pictorial work that was done, like newspaper photos in manuscript form, are mostly images of the daily business of dealing with the dead. In fact, many of the images that have been assumed were of the Black Death are, in fact, not. There's a famous illumination from a 15th century manuscript where a couple lays in bed, all covered over with terrible bumps. I've always seen it described as a scene depicting the Black Death, but it isn't. It's actually a depiction of the sixth biblical plague. Um, there's a 15th century image by Jacopo Odi from the La Franceschina Codex depicting Franciscan monks treating victims of a plague in Italy. At least that's been the common interpretation. It's not, however. It's actually about treating lepers. Of the two images known to be actually plague-related and contemporary, one of the earliest was drawn in 1349. Uh, it shows people carrying coffins of those who have died of the illness in Torne, Italy. The second, and more sinister, is from a history book written in the 1340s by chronicler and French poet Gil de Muisis, where townsfolk burn Jews who were blamed for causing the plague. So before the Black Death hit, Europe was actually well on its way to the Renaissance. Gone were the flat, stylized, almost comic book paintings and manuscripts of the earlier era, or the stylized statues that basically were very stiff and all looked the same. Painting and sculpture were steadily finding its way back to the naturalism of the Greeks and Romans. A good example of this are the frescoes of Giotto at the Scrivegni Chapel in Padua. Uh, Giotto's figures are not stylized or elongated. Uh, they're three-dimensional. They have faces and gestures. They're clothed not in the swirling stylized uh, fabric of earlier times, but actually they look like fabric hanging from a human body, drapery that has form and weight. Um, he also took some really bold steps in foreshortening and creating the illusion of space. Oftentimes he would have his groups of figures configured in a way that the viewer actually appears to be part of the scene and is involved somehow. So they're incredibly involving and very modern in his uh, take on a very old art form. There's also a 14th century Gothic triptych of the Virgin Mother, probably created for a lay owner 
out of ivory with scenes from the life of the Virgin. Here, the Virgin stands very naturally with her hip raised, balancing her baby. Um, you can see the difference between this virgin and child contrasted with a similar virgin and child from the 13th century uh, made out of wood in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. In this one, the 13th century version, the virgin is straight, staring straight ahead, uh, her child on her lap, a tiny copy of the Madonna. They're figureheads or totems. They're not representative of uh, real life. They're representative of a, of a stylized norm. In any case, an argument can be made that the Black Death uh, kicked the enlightened thinking and the trend towards naturalism of the Renaissance back by about a century. So back to the question of art during the plague. Did no one depict Black Death at the time? No, not really. I mean, again, everybody was too preoccupied with the business of death and dying. Though an additional reason might be the curious phenomenon of collective forgetting. This has happened all through history, an event so traumatic that an entire populace sort of goes into a state of merciful semi-amnesia. A recent iteration of this is the 1918 flu pandemic that left virtually no place in the world untouched. I only learned about the Spanish flu. By the way, the 1918 flu is actually now believed to have started at an uh, army camp in Kansas, not in Spain. Um, I learned about it a few years ago while watching a PBS um, American Experience episode. What, said I, I've never heard of this before. And I routinely ask my students if they've heard of the 1918 flu before I send them off to get vaccinated at the flu clinic. Uh, and the majority of them have never heard of it. In an article published in Slate magazine that I just read about literature in the 1918 flu, Rebecca Onion asks scholar Elizabeth Outka, about why there was such a collective forgetting. She says, diseases are recorded differently by our minds than something like a war. By their nature, diseases are highly individual. Even in a pandemic situation, you're fighting your own internal battle with the virus and it's individual to you. Many, many people in a pandemic situation may be fighting that same battle, but it's strangely both individualized and widespread. It's difficult to memorialize a pandemic because disease makes people feel helpless and there's very little we can do to make meaning from it. It's simply a tragedy. So the horror of the Black Death must have had the same sort of paralyzing effect on the psyches of those that lived through it. I mean, it took the span of a hundred years before artists, writers, philosophers, chroniclers, and the clergy began to ponder the tragedy with all the necessary distance to have a more objective point of view. I mean, what did it all mean? Why did this happen? It wasn't until the late 1400s that artists began to depict the Black Death. This manifested itself in countless examples. There was the Dance of Death, uh, Death and the Maiden, the Three Quick and the Three Dead, Trances Tombs and Memento Mori were all popular motifs during this time. Uh, arrows were a common symbol of the disease of the plague. Uh, angels, demons, skeletons, all carrying long shafts and sticking people with the pointy end. Even the Madonna and Christ himself are depicted in a woodblock print from the 1400s, interceding, preventing a vengeful, sorry, loving God from firing plague arrows into a group of cowering townsfolk. St. Sebastian, of whom I saw many a gory painting and sculptures in my impressionable youth, became the saint to pray to, by the way, if you were trying to escape the plague. This was obviously because he took one, actually ones, for the team. He's the guy who was martyred by being shot full of arrows. Again, the arrows being tied to a wrathful god who would destroy his people by shooting plague arrows from the heavens. In a painting by French artist, Jos Liferix, at the end of the 15th century, St. Sebastian kneels before God while a grave attendant is stricken with the plague as he's burying someone who died from the disease. He has a prominent bubo on his neck. That's one of the first times a bubo was depicted in a piece of fine art. There is a, also a medical treatise on the plague and how to treat it. It's a block print where the plague victim shows three physicians the bubo under his armpit. It was created around 1500 by a surgeon named Hieronymus Brunschweig. There's another woodbock print from Germany in the late 15th century of showing doctors how to lance a bubo, which was thought to be how to get rid of the plague. The doctor tenderly holds the man's shoulder to brace him as he lances the bubo 
presumably without anesthetic of any kind. And the poor man looks like he has buboes on his head, on his back, on his knees. He's not doing very well. The guy's a goner. Death and the Maiden, or Der Tod und das Mädchen in German, as I mentioned before, was a common motif uh, after the plague, especially painting and prints, which all originated in Germany. The usual form shows a uh, lovely young woman being seized by a personification of death, usually as a skeleton. The Dance of Death, also called Dance Macabre, is a late medieval allegory of the universality of death and a common depiction in art. In the Dance Macabre, death obeys no rule of time or place. He's the great leveler. A terrific example of a later addition to the canon are the absolutely exquisite woodcuts of Hans Holbein the Younger, 1523 to 25, and they are gorgeous. Holbein's woodcuts are a highly original take on this medieval theme. In Holbein's series, no one is actually engaged in a dance with death. There are more static figures that respond to death almost realistically, like the old man is stoical. He knows he's going to die. The panicked knight tries to fight death off with all his useless might. And the rich miser throws his arms up in a mix of outrage and terror. Nobody's going to take his money away from him. The peddler is almost too busy to even acknowledge his time has come because he's too busy peddling. They are gorgeous. I've always loved those things. Memento Mori and the Three Quick and the Three Dead, which is a specific example of the Memento Mori theme, have a rather earlier beginning but really took off in the 15th century. Memento Mori literally means remember death, and in the art world is an artistic or symbolic representation of the inevitability of death. Fervent Christianity, which by the way was on the rise after the Black Death, um, emphasized heaven, hell, and salvation of the soul in the afterlife and brought death to the forefront of consciousness. So in addition to skeletons and decaying corpses, there's also demons and devils and the pit of hell awaiting for you if you refuse to live a good life in anticipation of a good death. By the way, shout out here to Caitlin Dowdy of Ask a Mortician fame and creator of The Order of the Good Death, which happily has nothing to do with sin. If you haven't listened to her, you are actually really missing out on something amazing and inspired. The Three Living and Three Dead, or Three Quick and Three Dead, uh, depicts three living men meeting three dead men, one newly dead, one in the process of rotting, and one who's a skeleton who is really most sincerely dead. The three living men look on in horror as they encounter these three specters who helpfully remind them that as we are, you too shall be. There are many grisly interpretations on this theme. A really striking one, and one of my favorites, a riff on it, if you will, is a bridal pair or the bridal pair at the Cleveland Museum of Art by an anonymous artist uh, from the 1470s. On the front of the painting is a lovely young couple. Their hair is long, curling, and golden. They've got circlets of gold on their heads, golden rings on their fingers. Behind them is lush, flowery foliage that speaks to their youth and fertility. They're embracing. Their clothing is rich in bridal finery. They look lovingly into each other's eyes, and the groom tenderly hands the bride a little posy of forget-me-nots. But there's a back to this painting, too. The back was actually removed in the early 20th century and now lives at the Musée de Oeuvre Notre-Dame in Strasbourg. And on it is depicted our lovely couple now rotting together. They have the rictus of the cadaver. They have these horrible cadaver grins. They have worms and snakes weaving out of their bodies. A toad rests on the pubis of the no longer lovely bride, and her breasts are these sagging bags of flesh. The groom has uh, insects all over him. Like I said, he's being eaten by worms. There's just a few wisps on his ugly mummified head, and it's truly gruesome, horrifying, and humbling. Another take on Memento Mori are something called trances tombs. These are tombs where the top of the tomb has a lovely effigy of the individual buried within, while the lower layer has the same person in the state of a rotting corpse. And these tombs are macabre works of genius. I absolutely loved them. They're crafted by mostly anonymous sculptors. Um, there's very rarely a name attached to any of them, which is a shame because they're really inspired. I read a great LSU master's thesis by Anna Louise Desromont about the Black Death and its effect on 14th and 15th century art, where she elaborates on these amazing tombs. So I'm paraphrasing here, but 
After the Black Death, funerary monuments became increasingly elaborate and appeared more and more frequently. Um, this reflected people's interest in being remembered and prayed for so that even if one died unexpectedly or unprepared, which was pretty much everybody during the Black Death, and one's soul was destined for purgatory, one could still attain salvation. Some trancy tombs were actually commissioned before the individual died, which makes one wonder why anybody would want to be remembered in such a grotesque state. The awareness of death precipitated by the Black Death created such a frightened society that was consumed by earthly actions like humility that would ensure soul salvation. So if you made your effigy hideous, it was like a reminder, see, see how humble I am? Can I have my get out of purgatory free card now? One of the earliest trancy tombs is that of François de la Serra, a Swiss nobleman who died around 1363, so right after the Black Death. He's buried at the Church of la Serra's in Switzerland. His trancy is covered with snakes and frogs and worms that are emerging from his rotting corpse. Medieval men actually thought that worms lived within the human body, and when you died, those worms would actually come out of your body and start consuming you. That's kind of gross. The whole thing got debunked with cheese and a couple of bell jars, but that's for another story. After the death of Cardinal Lagrange in 1402, a monumental tomb was erected according to instructions that he left in his will. The upper layer of the tomb is a lovely representation of the cardinal in robes and splendor, and the trancy is below, and the lower layer is the rotting corpse with the following inscription. We have been made a spectacle for the world so that the older and younger may look clearly upon us in order that they may see to what state they will be reduced. No one is excluded regardless of a state, sex, or age. Therefore, miserable one, why are you proud? You are only ash. You will revert, as we have done, to a fetid cadaver, food and tidbits for worms and ashes. There is another great epitaph from the transy tomb of Archbishop Henry Chickaly in Canterbury Cathedral. I love these epitaphs. I want one on my own grave. It's similar to Cardinal Lagrange's tomb in both the representations of the dead man and the inscription which reads, I was a pauper born than to primate raised. Now I'm cut down and ready to be food for worms. Behold my grave. Whoever you may be who passes by, I ask you to remember you will be like me after you die all horrible dust, worms, and vile flesh. One of the most amazing depictions of the ravages of death is by Peter Bruegel the Elder. It's called The Triumph of Death. I'm going to be talking about this for a minute or two. Peter Bruegel the Elder's The Triumph of Death was plague-inspired but not painted until around 1562-1563. It's oil on panel and resides in room 055A at the Prado Gallery in Madrid, Spain. This masterpiece is probably one of the most iconic and frightening paintings ever made. It's not until Goya's Disasters of War that was completed between 1810 and 1820, which I'll be discussing in another episode, that there was anything in European arts that was equivalent to the savageness of hell on earth that is depicted in this painting. The Triumph of Death hangs directly across the room from Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights, since Bruegel was sort of viewed by his contemporaries as the second Bosch. And these two paintings together in this room make very suitable companions. They're both very disturbing in very different ways. So who was Peter Bruegel the Elder? He was born, we think, in 1525 and died in Brussels in 1569. He was a successful printmaker before he turned to painting. He was not a peasant, he was not wealthy, but he had a lot of really, really, really rich patrons that uh, kept him afloat and let him do the kind of art that he wanted to do. In Bruegel's The Triumph of Death, the scenes depicted may be imagined, yikes, what an imagination, or he could have been influenced by earlier artists, depictions of earlier plagues, similar topics, or even his own eyewitness observations of war atrocities or subsequent plagues, which is kind of horrible to think about. In any case, the painting depicts the literal triumph of death over all earthly living things, expressed by an army of skeletons absolutely raising the earth. 
In the foreground of the scene of the painting, Death leads his armies on the back of a reddish horse, destroying the world of the living. The background is an absolute nightmare. In fact, you can look at this painting for hours and not see everything that's there. The background's a nightmare, though. Barren landscapes, scenes of destruction, carnage. No one is spared. It provides viewers with no glimpse of hope whatsoever. There's no Christian hope in this painting. Surviving humans are led to an enormous coffin. There's no chance of escape. There's a skeletons on either side with uh, coffin-shaped shields that are blocking the people from trying to sneak past them, trying to escape their fate. Um, the whole work is done in this weird reddish-brown tone, sort of giving the scene a fiery tint or a prelude to hell. Sometimes I don't know if this guy's moralizing or if it's grim gallows humor, and I actually think it's probably a bit of both. Um, it's, it's a strangely horrifying yet amusing thing to look at. Among those depicted in this painting, and there's just tons of people, like a typical Bruegel painting, they're all over the place. They're rich, they're poor, some struggle, some are resigned. Um, the only respite from the horror... Uh, of, the, of the entire scene, in the very, very, very lower right-hand corner, there's a pair of doomed lovers who gaze into each other's eyes. They're completely impervious to the stuff that's going on around them. They have that blissfulness of eternal youth where you think that you're immortal. There is one woman in this painting. She's in the foreground. She's face down. She's got a headdress on. She's been dropped, dropped in her tracks. She's holding her baby, who is laying on the ground dead, face up. And a skeletal dog is looking like he's going to eat the baby's face. And I looked at this painting recently, and I was reminded of a photograph that always haunted me. It's a famous one. It's of an identical mother in a very similar headdress, face down with her dead baby in her arms. But this one is from the morning of March 16th, 1988. This is when Saddam Hussein dropped chemical gas on the village of Halabja in northern Iraq. The pose... The pitiful waste of life, the horror, the randomness of who lives, who dies, transcend the centuries from Bruegel's painting to today. It's heartbreaking. The more things change, the more they seem to stay exactly the same. I think I mentioned this before, but one of the more interesting aspects of Bruegel's masterpiece, given its theme and the time of which it was painted, is that there's a very obvious lack of Christian iconography. I mean, Salvation through Christ, a fundamental message in other medieval pictures that warn of death's inevitability, you better be ready, you better be humble, you better have a good life and a good death, is completely missing in The Triumph of Death. Instead, the hope for salvation is substituted by taunting nihilism, which is probably why I like this painting so much, being a nihilist. There are a pair of grinning skeletons pulling on a black bell in the upper left-hand corner. They're not ringing out the triumph of the second coming of Christ, but rejoicing in the fact that humanity is doomed. There are skeletons in the lower right-hand corner chasing women like doomed secretaries around a table, hosting the remains of a luncheon or a card game. There's a delusional guy who draws his sword, hoping to kill the already dead figure that stands before him. The people scream, running. Death is slitting a man's throat, bottom center. There's death healthily assisting a dying merchant, bottom left. There's a king splayed out, dying at the bottom left-hand corner. No one, absolutely no one, is spared in this painting. Death unceremoniously dumps the bodies from coffins. There's no dignity even for the already dead. People are trying to flee on a bridge. They're pushed or pulled in by death. There's already bloated corpses floating in the brackish water below. Death shoots those fatal plague arrows at fleeing men. Death executes a man in the background by beheading. Catherine wheels and garrots dot the background, the countryside replete with corpses and rotting bodies and broken bones. Death takes over a siege tower. Death takes over a church. Death overruns peasants trying to defend themselves with sticks and pitchforks. There are pits full of dead people. There are pits full of dead animal carcasses and skeletons. There's dead fish, dead sea creatures. Buildings burn to the ground in the distance. And skeletons beat time on huge skin-covered kettle drums. Curiously, there's like a really odd window on the left midsection of the painting. It's part of a broken tower where those two grinning skeletons are ringing the bell up above. Um, there's also death digging up coffins and a gangway full of skeletons jutting out from below. But this window, it looks like it's from 
H.P. Lovecraft. There's like a tentacled skeleton, a gruesome, many-armed death deity with little runic marks around it, overlooking the ghastly scene of horror below it. It's really strange and really compelling. Wow. Ultimately, not only does Bruegel's triumph of death clearly illustrate the inevitability of death and its unsparingness with both high society and low, but it also shows that death is perversely creative as well, at least in Bruegel's imagination. I got to admit, I'm a little terrified of the guy. The triumph of death and its grisly atmosphere was ridiculed back in the 19th century by a uh, Swiss historian Jakob Burckhardt, who described Bruegel as a crude and vulgar painter, quote unquote. But it's that same matter of fact, enthusiastic embracement of gruesomeness and the readiness to include realism and atmosphere that Burckhardt mocked that makes Peter Bruegel the elder's work so perpetually loved. I mean, I adore the thing. I'd have it on my wall. It's fantastic. So, the Black Death. My students may not know what the 1918 flu was, but pretty much everybody knows the Black Death. It's somehow ever in human consciousness. It's like this memory of this pandemic has never been erased. It even haunts in sort of like a, a dark and distant whisper current thought as we shelter in place during this COVID-19, the thoughts kind of being, well, it can't possibly be as bad as the Black Death, can it? So Jennifer Wright, the author of Get Well Soon, History's Worst Plagues and the Heroes Who Fought Them, writes, as history repeats itself, so will art. She continues, good writing about plague is never just about the plague. It's about the other social issues made manifest in times of plague. For instance, Angels in America is not just about AIDS. It's not even about how Reagan responded to AIDS. It's about how Americans deal with the idea of our mortality. Wright is hopeful but doubtful, guessing that many Americans will want to forget about this scary, sad time as soon as possible, as discussed earlier regarding, like, the 1918 flu pandemic. Quote, Americans only like stories where they emerge as the victors. Americans don't like to think about things like the Spanish flu. Gallery owner Mark Egan wrote to Jerry Saltz in Vulture magazine in an article about COVID-19, quote, Art will not survive as some dull thing, some social good that we must support out of consensual responsibility to the social good. Art will explode with the desires of the people to see action play out, with tears, screams, harmonies, and some death. He goes on, Watch what happens next. Galleries will go under, unless they survive. How to survive? passion, obsession, desire. Indeed, in this time of sheltering in place, he just moved his gallery to a decrepit building across from a garbage dump and told me he opened, quote, a secret show, unquote, Saltz continues. I thought I felt the rumble of art's old thunder when he wrote this to me. In the meantime, in facing the coronavirus pandemic, people around the world have already taken comfort in the arts. There's been Musicians live streaming concerts, there's been families having sing-alongs, there's actors who've Zoomed performances of Shakespeare, and artists have painted vibrant outdoor murals that bring color to public spaces that are now found empty. This is happening in my own town of Portland, Oregon. These paintings capture not only the devastating impact of the virus, but also they show the hope there is in overcoming it. We can turn to the arts from plagues, past, to remind ourselves that our ancestors have faced times like these before. And as Jennifer Wright says, quote, you know that you're not alone. Humanity survived. That's episode one in the can. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or corrections or anything else you'd like to add, please contact us at artistsobscura at gmail.com. And tune in next time for an episode about castration and cannibalism. Goya's Saturn devouring his son.